Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, welcome uh, to the Lunch Symposium sponsored by Olea Medical. Uh, my name is Adam Davis. Uh, I am a neuroradiologist and the Chief Medical Officer at Olea Medical. Our symposium today uh, on artificial intelligence, automation, and visualization uh, is very exciting to me because I believe that these are the technologies that will most greatly impact medical imaging in the next several years. Uh, I'm particularly excited because we have tremendous speakers today. Uh, we have Dr. Marco Essig, uh, who is professor and chairman at the University of Manitoba, uh, as well as the uh, director of uh, diagnostic health imaging uh, for that region with the Winnipeg Health Authority. He is a globally recognized expert in advanced MRI imaging, uh, has over 200 peer-reviewed papers, uh, and uh, is uh, truly, a, truly a fine gentleman. Our other speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Chang, is a neuroradiologist uh, who is the co-director of the uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Diagnostic Medicine at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he is a recognized expert in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, in his uh, brief career, he has acquired more uh, awards and accolades than I have in my 20 years of practice, uh, including the American Society of Neuroradiology uh, Cornelius Dyke Award uh, for Best Research on Artificial Intelligence, which was quite an honor. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's jump right into this. Um, I will be speaking about visualization. And uh, these are my financial disclosures. As I mentioned, I'm the chief medical officer for Olea Medical, uh, but I am uh, also involved in the technology head-mounted display um, uh, research and development. Uh, I'm a former uh, associate professor uh, at New York University Medical Center and was the director of the imaging labs uh, for almost a decade. Uh, keeping me involved in the world of visualization and image post-processing. Um, when you look at the technologies that are impacting uh, imaging today, these are the general recognized overall uh, broad categories. And we can see that within display, within software, computer-aided uh, automation, as well as within modality design. For the purpose of the symposium, we'll be concentrating on three, computer-aided automation and analysis, artificial intelligence, and display. So first, let's start off with um, a definition, just for those in the audience who aren't initiated uh, into this field, visualization can be thought of as a graphical representation of data or concepts. It's really your visual um, symbol for information in the world. It's the highest band method of moving, of moving information in the external world into your body. It's, it acts as an external artifact, a symbol for decision making, and that makes visualization the clinical tool, the cognitive tool that we use to make medical decisions. Medical imaging is really spatial scalar data, and if you think about it otherwise, then that's really an old concept of how to think about radiographic, uh, radiographic practice. Visualization is fundamental to understanding image-driven medicine. And Within visualization, there are really two separate components. There's the display or hardware component and the content or software component. And for the purpose of this talk, we'll be discussing two rapidly evolving technologies within this field. We will be discussing head-mounted display and we'll be discussing volume rendering. So first, let's start with some definitions. Um, Virtual reality uh, is an interactive uh, computer-generated experience that takes place within a simulated environment. It incorporates visual and, and other senses. Virtual reality is an immersive experience, uh, whether the environment that you're in is an ordinary environment or a, a fantasy environment. 
when you are within a virtual reality experience, you have a feeling of being removed from your surroundings. And within the, the field, that's referred to as presence. Augmented reality is slightly different. It's a form of virtual reality in which computer-generated graphics, text, some type of information is superimposed on the real world scene. Um, this takes place within a headset or any other type of see-through modality that you might be using. It allows the user to take computer-generated information and superimpose it on the environment around them. And there are many ways that this can be done. For brevity, XR is a terminology that we use to refer to the entire virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality system. So within healthcare, there are two broad categories of XR. The first is diagnostic. And that's when we're using this technology to convey medical data or information. The device is not part of the therapeutic practice. There's an entire other paradigm for virtual reality, and that is for therapeutic procedures, for pain reduction, for anxiety relief, and also for psychotherapy. And there is now a burgeoning literature about virtual reality for psychotherapy, which it turns out to be quite an effective uh, method. For the purpose of this lecture, we're discussing XR as a method to convey information for real medical practice in real time. So what about the content? What do we place uh, within, this, uh, within virtual reality, augmented reality, or any type of display? Well, there are generally three types. There's DICOM, which is radiologists we're familiar with. It's the primary source of information for these different methodologies. DICOM imaging really can be broken down into three subsets of information the shape and the surface, the spatial relationships of the voxels within it, and scalar properties, Helms field units, uh, signal intensity. There's also data that's textual or, char or, um, or characters, and we use this for physiologic monitoring, patient records, things of that nature. And the last is illustrative graphics. And this is mostly used for icons and medical equipment or for medical education. There is a large number of products out there that you can use uh, for uh, XR, and this is one of the most rapidly growing fields uh, in, the uh, in the technology market. We have, uh, for virtual reality, numerous uses, see-through, uh, HoloLens, and Magic Leap. Uh, for smart glass augmented reality, others, um, other products as well. So how do we use this? Okay. Um, so what we're seeing here is not a video. This is a radiographic well, procedure that is. That first is important. You can, can we see uh, on screen that, the that was down? relatively stagnant. That's going to tell us something about the portal pressure and also our desire to move quickly. So this is a great sigh of relief in every case for anybody who does tips because we are secured, we're across, and we got through the first several events, and now we kind of see the end in well, sight. Well, I guess not. So, is there any way to bring the volume down? I'm going to connect up. OK. So what we're seeing here is a radiographic, is a interventional procedure that was filmed in a 360 degree mode. What you were seeing was not a video. That was me interacting with this data virtually, moving around, zooming in. And this is the kind of technique that is starting to be used for radiology education. We can also use that same exact uh, virtual reality concept. <laughs>
But it's really this cutting plane can be used to either cut through the vault. Is there any way to? Uh... Okay. Much better. But really, virtual reality impacts the radiologist. And what we're seeing here is a uh, 3D reconstruction DICOM uh, data set uh, that is being projected within a virtual reality headset. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Katten at the University of uh, Basel. And what he's doing is using a clip plane with the controllers, um, with this virtual reality headset, to interrogate the data. He can move through this data in the 3D representation, uh, but he can also convert it into that more familiar uh, multiplanar reformat that we see as radiologists. This is a very powerful way of looking at the data because it combines all the different fundamental aspects that we use in our imaging to look at a radiographic study. We can see that the lighting, just as if you were on a uh, uh, post-processing workstation, can be manipulated in the virtual reality uh, environment. The power is that there is depth, there is stereo, there is presence to on looking at this, uh, at this information. And it's really more than uh, new techniques. We can use virtual reality uh, to uh, simulate the radiologist's reading room. This was presented at the Human uh, Computer uh, Graphics Interaction meeting in Berlin just last October. And what we see here is a radiologist reading with a virtual, within a virtual reading room, able to adjust the parameters of the images that they're looking at, able to do the uh, window and the level in order to move through it. This can replace what we traditionally think of as a radiology reading room. This video is from my friends at Metabis, and it shows how augmented reality using information from uh, the, the Department of Radiology impacts surgical guidance. This is a T1 MP rage post gadolinium, it is co-registered to the patient's head, and the surgeon is wearing an augmented reality see-through head-mounted display. And he can use this for surgical planning. We can see actually where the tumor is, use a clip plane, plan your craniotomy, see the overlying veins. It's a very powerful technique. This is being used currently in most academic medical centers, and I guarantee you it will be widespread. And as radiologists, it is mandatory that we have an understanding of this type of technology. Head mapped display really depends upon two internal components within the content. First is stereoscopy, and the second is monocular depth cues. So stereoscopy is that feature that we use as human beings. Uh, to visualize an object uh, and understand its depth perception. It is the most powerful method of understanding depth and perspective within two meters. Basically, objects are, pre are projected at two different points on the retina, and your brain interprets that as depth information. It then combines it in order to understand the relative position of what you're seeing. There is extensive literature in industry and in medicine about stereoscopy. Even though it's always under the radar and people don't notice this, this is a proven technique for conveying information to the radiologist. Stereoscopy has shown better selective attention with a better comprehension of complex data, improved manual task performance, and this is particularly impactful on novices. Novice trainees given stereoscopic virtual reality training progress faster than their traditional training counterparts. And this has been shown multiple times in the literature. What's interesting is that 
when you look at presence within virtual reality, the quality, the impact of presence correlates directly with the quality of the stereoscopy. And that's an interesting, that's interesting to note because it really says it's the content of what you're seeing that's driving the experience. Monocular depth cues are used in medical volume rendering and it's basically a 2D representation of 3D space. Perspective and shading, the object size, this is what gives information to the viewer. So the question is, why don't we routinely use 3D volume imaging as radiologists? Why isn't this our primary method review? And this is what we want to investigate. We put a patient in a multi-detector CT and we scan volumetrically. We receive spatial data. This is the output of what we do every day. And this is really what we want to see. But instead, as radiologists, this is what we use. And the question is why? Why do we do that? What's the result of doing that? diminished inherent information, diminished spatial understanding, you lose contrast information with volume imaging. Traditionally, it's thought, thought by radiologists that if you send all of the data from an imaging study, it's too much. And that's really an obsolete thought. Radiologists often claim that they take 2D images and they bring them together in their mind and then they understand the, the spatial relationships that they're looking at. And that's been shown time and time again not necessarily to be true. So this is a special phantom uh, that I developed. This is a CT through the phantom. We are seeing it in the highest resolution, 0.6 millimeter MPR in sagittal, axial, and coronal planes. And we can see that it's made up of two different objects. There's a low, uh, low Hounsfield unit uh, interior and a higher Hounsfield unit outer component to this. And as radiologists, we should instantly understand what this is. All the inherent information is being presented to you in the best format that we currently have today. And this is the exact same phantom being scanned utilizing volumetric 3D rendering. So we can see, yes, there's a circular object and it's sitting on top of a wedge. But as we start to interrogate the information, we can see there's a lot more inherent information that we really did not appreciate on traditional imaging. And this happens every day. Not just this study, but in any study you read, there is inherent spatial information that you simply don't understand utilizing 2D imaging. Reviewing large amounts of information, that information overload that radiologists speak about, and then rapidly identifying only those components that are important, that's a difficult problem, not only for medicine, but for all industries, in the financial industry, in commerce, in aerospace. That's a big problem. Finding data and then finding what's really important. Artificial intelligence does this much better than human beings do, and that's the power of AI. It can sort through large amounts of data and learn from it and find those relevant points and bring it together, synthesize what it's looking at. But volume rendering provides a visualization-based solution to this problem for human beings. It's a more powerful and efficient manner to understand large, complex medical data sets. The idea that radiologists are given too much data and need to dumb it down to read every day, that's an obsolete, that's an obsolete concept. We need to start looking at data, at medical imaging, in a format that's more powerful and in one in which we understand. So let's get to the guts of this. Let's get to, to the center of what we're doing here. It really is about the display and the volume rendering. When we, do, when we acquire a 3D volume data set for a CT or an MRI or even now for an ultrasound or a rotational angiographic study, we take that data set and we reconstruct it. And the reconstruction is really whatever was the idea that came from some software engineer's mind. And the quality of that reconstruction affects the quality of the information that you see as a radiologist. The most common method that we use is ray casting. We send a ray of light uh, through the volume data set. It intersects on the other side. And then we make a 2D representation of a 3D data set. We have tools such as opacity and, and um, 
uh, ambient uh, luminescence, and we have tools such as segmentation and clip planes in order to interrogate that. But really, the rules, the parameters of those algorithms affects what you see. At the bottom, we see a maximum intensity projection and a volume rendered uh, image. And they're really two different projections, even though they're the exact same data set with just slightly different rules. So it really impacts us. So the question, ah, so here we see this is a uh, uh, ACOM aneurysm, and it is the exact same data set, and this is post-processed with two different softwares. And we can see the difference in quality. One, a little hazy, we lose detail, and in the other, we see the topographic detail. Um, we have a better understanding of the anatomy that we're looking at. And even when we go clip into it, we can see an endovascular view on the left. We have the internal information, and on the right, nothing. Same data set, just two different software reconstructions. So the question is, can we do better? Traditional ray casting is now being replaced by path tracing. Path tracing is a technique that was used within the movie industry for animation for decades. What path tracing does, instead of sending a single ray of light through the volume and simulating that, it starts to look at the interaction of light within that volume, how the light bounces from object to object. And when you do that, it creates a more photorealistic appearance. It gives us an improved visualization, a better understanding of spatial relationships. On the top, that's the traditional uh, ray casting, and on the bottom, we can see how the light takes many paths through the uh, data set that we're looking at. So this tracing technique now gives us reflection, refraction, shadows. It simulates real life more than what we're used to looking at in our traditional medical volume rendering. This is a ray of light bouncing off of three different surfaces. And now we have the problem. Because this is exponential. When you start to have light bouncing off of different surfaces, this gets complex very quickly. This is only three bounces uh, for um, six different rays of light. You can imagine if you're simulating millions of rays of light. This becomes computationally too dense, too overwhelming for the traditional computers that we use in, in hospitals medicals, and medical centers. So we need ways of getting around that. And there are solutions to this. We can use Monte Carlo methods, which is we randomly sample the light. It's very photorealistic, but it's also very slow. And it's not practical for everyday radiographic imaging. We can also use photon maps. And what we do is we pre-calculate where the light should be. And we make assumptions about the objects and where the light will reflect. And when we do this, we can store it in lookup tables. The advantage is that now this photorealistic rendering is real time. We can use it as radiologists at the workstation. We can see a photorealistic image of our medical studies, of our CTs and of our MRIs. This is an MRI of the brain uh, uh, with global illumination uh, provided by Canon and Vital Images. That's a DTI of the brain. That's a CT of the knee. Okay, replacement in the leg. CT of the lungs, CTA of the abdomen. You really appreciate it when you bring kinetics, movement into it. We can see the shadows projecting. We can see the, the complex spatial relationships. We can start to see the texture, the surface texture. And as human beings, this speaks to us. We have millions of years of evolution that says this is how you want to see the world. And when you do this, it brings to you more inherent information. On the left, we see a path tracing uh, reconstruction of a pericolosal aneurysm. And on the right, a traditional volume rendered tracing. And you can see the obvious difference between the two, the degree of understanding small detail within the image. On the left, we see a global illumination reconstruction of a CTA of the hand, and on the right, the traditional VRT, a much greater representation, greater uh, imaging detail between the two. So this is a relatively new technique. It's been used in, uh, in the movies for decades. But in medicine, it was only introduced a few years ago. 
but we're now starting to see the clinical impact of indirect lighting within the literature. The first uh, that uh, was, uh, I presented at the American Society of Neuroradiology about a year ago is that these new techniques, these ray tracing techniques, are superior to volume rendering even if you eliminate the photorealistic effect. Just the inherent algorithms uh, of, that simulate light within the 3D data set provides better surface detail than what we're used to seeing. Even though the resolution is the same, if you measure it in a phantom, the visual properties change. And that's important because it says there's more to seeing an image than our traditional radiographic measurements of how good an image is. Resolution and contrast within phantoms will not be the entire story as our visualization starts to become more advanced and more complicated. A forensic study showed that determining the uh, age of pelvic fractures was just as accurate using global illumination within a CT of that pelvis as, if you, as compared with actually examining the bones. They were equivalent. And the third, uh, which leads into what we're about to hear, uh, what we're, uh, the next speakers are about to uh, lecture, is that deep learning algorithms trained with this photorealistic imaging has a better understanding of depth and spatial relationships as compared with not only traditional 3D imaging, but even with endoscopic pictures. So what we're seeing is that this photorealistic reconstruction seems to be providing information that we don't normally inherently have. So with that, I would like to move on to the next two speakers. Hope you appreciated that. Thank you for your time. Dr. Peter Chang. Thank you very much for the, uh, the introduction and, of course, to Olia for hosting this uh, very informative and thought-provoking session. Building off of what Adam was just talking about, I I'd like to highlight the fact that uh, right, many of the common themes you're about to hear today have to, again, deal with the very high uh, resolution and high dimensional data that is now becoming the norm in radiology, right? And, and what we need to now do is come up with creative strategies and tools to help deal with that data efficiently. I think visualization is an important and key aspect of, of solving that problem. And what we'll talk about in the, in the next two sessions here uh, it, are some more AI-driven uh, techniques. Now, again, as a brief background, uh, I am both a uh, tr practicing neuroradiologist by training, um, uh, but what I spend the vast majority of my time doing now is actually working as a software engineer uh, and data scientist to actually develop tools uh, using deep learning. Uh, and I bring that up only because what I will try to do in the next 15 minutes is to identify the intersection between things that AI technology are well suited to solve today um, as well as uh, applications that to me are useful clinically, right? Try to find that unique uh, uh, intersection and identify the types of tools we're most expected to see in the near future. Uh, now, it goes without saying, I think uh, its theme has been uh, talked about quite a bit in this meeting already, but the technology we're going to be talking about here is artificial intelligence and specifically uh, deep learning neural networks. Now, this is the exact technology that is, in fact, driving the majority of innovation in fields outside of medicine and industry, things like self-driving cars, for example. Um, and, in fact, we're hearing so much of this technology in the news now that it may uh, become, uh, uh, we might take it a little for granted, right? It's hard to appreciate how powerful and new these techniques are. Uh, in fact, uh, voice recognition, for example, was, in fact, a military-grade technology with a significant amount of, of government funding just five or ten years ago. Uh, and, in fact, we have that same technology, all of us do, on our phones today. Right? Um, and another common example people throw out is the game of Go, uh, which has more number of moves 
than the number of atoms in the entire universe, right? So an extraordinarily challenging game that even, again, just five years ago, many experts would have told you is impossible to solve with traditional techniques. Um, so with that in mind, right, what exactly is deep learning and, and how do we appreciate its context? Well, the first thing to point out is that artificial intelligence right, is, is not a new field of study. It's been around for over uh, half a century and, and in fact, here just uh, about a decade or so after the first computers uh, were built in the world, uh, we have a group of very ambitious scientists who decided that uh, one summer they were going to uh, solve artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> no, no big deal. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, we all know that uh, they did not solve artificial intelligence in just one summer, but uh, what this group uh, essentially did, right, where they, they laid the groundwork for what would uh, be known eventually as artificial intelligence and, and the work that would follow in many years. Now, uh, this work uh, sort of gradually made, made some progress until about the early 90s when we started to see uh, the development uh, of a new type of artificial intelligence uh, that was uh, driven in part by big data and is now referenced under the broad term of machine learning. All right, so these techniques essentially used a human to kind of come up with mathematical rules and formulas to describe things on images uh, or non-imaging data and then use computers to find optimal thresholds cutoffs, right, for those formulas. So it's a combination of both humans and, and computers. Now, that technique was very powerful, and it has many uses today, uh, but one key limitation is the fact that a human ultimately needs to come up with the rules to uh, drive the AI algorithm forward, which means that if the human didn't come up with a very uh, exhaustive or comprehensive enough rule, the algorithm would be doomed for failure. So with that in mind, the sort of most recent and newest evolution uh, has been a, a newer form of AI referenced under deep learning or neural networks. And, and what we see now for the first time is that this learning technique can occur completely without any human intervention during the learning process, right? So images are simply shown to the computer and the AI system automatically determines what it needs to extract from the images. Another way of uh, thinking about this is that uh, as a developer, instead of having to explicitly code all sorts of rules and edge cases and exceptions, right, all I need to do is initialize a, a now virtual network of neurons, a virtual brain, and I simply give that virtual brain the capacity to reorganize itself, right, reweight its, its neurons. Uh, and again, naturally, through that process, the, the kind of intelligent behavior emerges. Um, as, a, as a little bit more of a background, I would say, uh, how many radiologists do we have in the audience today? People that look at images, a few of them, right? So uh, if I were to uh, take, for example, the detection of blood on a non-contrast, a CAT scan of the head, right? That's a pretty obvious, simple finding for a radiologist to make. It's high density, uh, really in any part of the brain where it doesn't belong. Prior to deep learning, prior to neural networks, there was not a single commercial tool that would be able to claim you know, high accuracy, automated detection of something as simple as hemorrhage, right? Uh, but within the past two years, with the ad advent and popularity of, of neural networks, we've now seen uh, four or five companies all claiming uh, such a product. So it just goes to highlight the value of this new technology. Now, the question that we have, of course, is what can deep learning AI solve? And the short answer is, is really anything, right? You can mathematically prove that it can uh, uncover virtually any pattern in data. But on a practical level, there's still some very important uh, limitations that, that, and bottlenecks that we see. The first is that the technique is primarily today, in 2019, a big data-driven problem. That means to achieve the state of the art, typically what you need is a very large uh, representative data set, which again means that primarily we're looking at disease processes that are, are very common, right? Things like stroke or, or very common types of cancer. The second consideration is uh, this idea I like to reference as uh, instinctive interpretation. So uh, if I have a problem that as a radiologist you can essentially look at that image and within a second tell me what, what's going on, a very instinctive kind of pattern recognition uh, type event, and then I, I could take that image away and you could still tell me what you saw, right? Yes, I saw blood, or yes, I saw a large mass in the lungs. 
that is something that the current AI technology is very, very well adapted at solving, right? No other new innovations or changes need to be made. We can build those tools right now. By contrast, if I have a, a little bit more of a complex sort of synthetic problem, uh, for example, looking at uh, uh, hydrocephalus or enlarged ventricles in the brain, if I uh, you know, see a drain and then realize that I need to look at certain parts of the brain to make the diagnosis, and then uh, you know, something looks a little abnormal, so I have to look at the prior exam. If I have to synthesize all those different steps serially, again, something that AI can definitely do, uh, but it's a, a much more challenging problem to solve. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to go through now a couple categories of, of types of applications that sort of fall, again, under the intersection of, of what's possible and what's useful. Um, and, uh, and we'll just show a few examples of applications. The first here is this idea of detection and triage, so the identification of a relatively simple but emergent finding uh, that can ultimately help rearrange our workflow as radiologists. So uh, again, not a diagnostic dilemma. These are not subtle findings. But the fact that you've automated this, the discovery helps really open up new clinical paradigms. As one example, uh, this is a tool we developed for detecting occlusion, so clots in the large vessels of the brain. Um, in this particular tool, the AI system first finds the large vessels, traces out the normal anatomy, and if it sees a particular area where that contrast bolus stops, it'll pick it up and tell you that there is, in fact, a, a large vessel occlusion somewhere in the study. Now, again, to a trained radiologist, this is not a very difficult finding to make. Uh, but if I could give this tool to all my secondary referral hospitals, right, and, and have them identify these patients right away for transfer, again, that, that helps accelerate and, and improve that overall clinical paradigm in a way that's not possible without fully automated techniques. Second category here is uh, the precise and reproducible measurement of disease in some way, so either measuring something or counting the number of abnormalities. Again, the value added here is not necessarily the fact that I as a human can't do this, it's the fact that it's simply too tedious or time consuming for me to do this well. Take, for example, the detection of hemorrhage, which, you know, from a detection perspective is just another triage problem like we saw before. But importantly, what this tool is also able to do is uh, tell you the volume of hemorrhage present in the brain. The tool, uh, uh, to cite some stats, is, is again very accurate for the detection, only 20 missed cases out of about 10,000 exams. But just as important, what I want to highlight here is the ability of the algorithm to tell you how much blood is present uh, in a patient, right? The, the first initial exam, right, that's when you have more of a diagnostic dilemma, but every follow-up exam after that, all I care about is whether the volume has increased or decreased, right? Um, with that in mind, uh, we compared this tool to a, a more traditional technique where radiologists make single-dimensional measurements and count the number of slices. We showed that on average that technique overestimated the ground truth of hemorrhage by about 20%. By contrast, the automated CNN-based technique uh, only slightly underestimated that volume of hemorrhage by about 2%. Similar uh, use case can be seen in brain tumors. Uh, both myself and really most of the top performers of the Mackay Challenge in the past several years have all demonstrated near human accuracy in the detection of, of brain tumors and the measurement of certain brain tumor uh, component volumes. Now the natural follow-up question is besides counting or, or measuring, uh, is there any other type of objective assessment that AI can help us as humans? Well, the reality is that as a clinician, the vast majority of everything I do is really some sort of qualitative or, or semi-quantitative analysis of a particular image finding. Take, for example, uh, a patient with stroke. So a patient comes in, they get a, a non-contrast CAT scan of the head, and as I scroll up and down that volume, right, what I'm trying to look for in the back of my head is an area of the brain that might be a little bit too dark or an area of the brain with just a little bit too much swelling. Right? And as I potent come up potential areas of abnormality, what I do is look back in my memory of all the head CTs that I've seen and try to say, is that a little bit too much? Is that uh, just a little bit too abnormal for me to go ahead and, and call an abnormality? 
Well, that process, right, can be done very efficiently and much more objectively with AI. And, and that's what we've done here in this example. Uh, so potential areas of abnormality are, are first highlighted by the tool. And then, again, the degree of darkness and the degree of mass effect is, is very quantitatively assessed. I will point out that I'm not trying to actually diagnose stroke. I'm only trying to diagnose the findings of stroke. And the reason, as the radiologists in the room may recognize, is that head CTs are not a perfect assessment for stroke. In fact, a patient with a true stroke can come in with a completely normal head CT, and that's totally fine. Right? In fact, if I take um, this tool and run it on a, a very large population of normal and abnormals, what I'll see is a continuous distribution of the amount of mass effect and the amount of darkness with a certain degree of overlap in the middle. Like, without question, that's, that's what we're going to see with head CTs. Instead, what we can do, rather than a simple binary classification, is take a new patient and put them very precisely on the continuum of possible findings and leave it to the clinician or the radiologist to adjust that threshold. Right? A patient comes in and a neurosurgeon asks you for an aspect score. Well, I'm just going to, any potential dark area of the brain is something I'm going to start to question, right? Whereas if I have a younger patient, very low suspicion of stroke, I'm probably more likely to pass certain areas uh, as being artifact or, or some other uh, uh, non-significant finding. Finally, extending now to things that are even more difficult for a human to do, uh, AI is actually very good at leveraging uh, and finding patterns in data. What I mean here is that typically, we acquire uh, uh, imaging data in a very raw form, right, and then use a number of post-processing techniques to get us intermediate things that humans can interpret easily. As an example, for MRI data, we tend to uh, acquire the raw data in, in what's known as case space or frequency domain and use techniques to generate images that I as a human uh, can then interpret. As I accelerate that process, acquire less data, right, my images become noisier, and while there are uh, mathematical formulae to, to sort of make this process a little bit uh, uh, smoother, it turns out a deep learning-based technique will be much better. Right? It can actually reconstruct with the a priori knowledge of what common patterns and common colors in an actual reconstructed image look like. And it's, it's been shown by myself and many others that the technique, uh, again, far outperforms uh, the traditional techniques. Another similar uh, application here is the 4D perfusion data. So again, what uh, we typically do in this process uh, is that uh, based on some raw CT data, we reconstruct a number of intermediate masks, right, things that I as a radiologist can then look at to infer the amount of dead brain tissue and arrive at the final ischemic core here. But the question, of course, right, is is why do we even bother doing this intermediate reconstruction? Why not, if we have the ground truth here on MRI, why not teach an AI to go directly from that raw data to the diagnosis? And in fact, that's what we've done and, and shown that this deep learning enabled technique is much more accurate uh, uh, than these intermediate uh, uh, type of maps. And so with that, um, I, I'm pretty much about out of time here. I, I just want to point out one uh, a small caveat, which is there are a number of applications that I did not talk about here. Um, things like, for example, classifying a benign or a malignant tumor on, on imaging or perhaps predicting which patients will respond to therapy. I do think that these are very valuable things to work on, and we are, in fact, uh, aggressively working in this area as well. But I will say that I don't think these are the early wins for AI, right? The reality is that technically these are very difficult problems to solve. And even if I had that tool today, right, even if it was built, I would need to run a number of clinical trials just to prove it's e efficacious in some way, and I have to tr completely change the treatment paradigms uh, that, that we're working with right now. So uh, again, very valuable things to, to work on. I think there's a number of other uh, types of applications to think about. But when we think about the most immediate impact, I think these are probably the categories to keep in mind. So with that, I uh, again thank you for your attention and welcome my colleague Marco, who will give a much more clinical perspective to some of these applications. Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much for that very great overview of what AI can do. And I'm coming more from a clinical perspective now and want to show you what the challenges are for uh, 
large department with a high uh, number of uh, scans and uh, some very complex clinical questions that we have to solve every day in a very short time frame that we have available for each of the patients. So um, a few disclosures. Um, uh, thanks again for Olea inviting me. And I have to disclose that there are polar bears in Manitoba, but they are not in Winnipeg. They are about 1,000 kilometers north. So it's not that dangerous uh, over there. So what are the challenges uh, for a large diagnostic department um, and uh, on a day-to-day -day practice? So first of all, our volume increases constantly. Just over the last five years in my own department, CT and MR volume have increased more than 30 percent. Uh, that has a negative impact on our quality, uh, so the errors and discrepancies are increasing. Uh, that's often increased with workload because everybody's working a little bit more, the reports are becoming shorter. Um, that's a really challenge in respect of quality management. And uh, beside that, we have a shortage of radiologists, not only in Western Europe, it's the same in North America and in Asia, around the world. There's a shortage of radiologists and especially subspecialized radiologists. Um, we have a growing use of quantitative and dynamic imaging techniques, so our exams are becoming more complex. It's not only 2D, it's now 3D or even 4D, because we add the dimension of volumetric, uh, which needs special uh, visualization, and we add dynamics like perfusion, spectroscopy, and other tools that uh, bring in a fourth dimension. So it's getting more and more complex. Um, there's a request for uh, imaging biomarkers in clinical practice and clinical studies, more and more, uh, especially in oncology. Um, and we have a request for structured reporting as well, like to extract really the main topics out of a very complex exam is becoming more and more challenging. And then there's the big trend towards personalized disease evaluation and so-called precision uh, medicine. So it's a uh, very challenging environment that we have in a clinical department. And of course, like the holy grail here is uh, AI. And there's a lot of tools that we can use actually uh, in our daily clinical practice. And this graph uh, kind of summarizes the different steps that we have in a, uh, a patient journey through our radiology department. It starts with scheduling, then uh, protocoling of the exam, image acquisition, uh, which is a big um, part here, and then the image interpretation uh, with the requirements for detection, segmentation, findings, uh, classification of the findings, and so on. Um, the same is true for interventions. And then we are in the area of reporting. So we are asked for structured reports. We have to give recommendations, um, patient reassurance, clinical committees, and discussions of our results. Um, and in all those areas, AI can really help us to optimize our workflow and get the work done at the end of the day. So what I would like to focus is on uh, two examples which I see where we definitely need in the near future AI tools to help us with the management of patients, and that's in emergency, emergency radiology as well as in oncology. And I would like to focus here mainly on stroke. Stroke is an important disease. Many people suffer from stroke. We have now new windows that we deal with, and we have to make a very uh, immediate, uh, very safe uh, decision whether a patient undergoes uh, treatment, yes or no, and what kind of a treatment. Uh, the same is for um, embolism, pulmonary embolism, and many, many other areas in emergency medicine. And in oncologic imaging, uh, we are using more and more uh, these advanced tools like perfusion, spectroscopy, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, fMRI for treatment planning. Um, and in oncology, it's, I will focus mainly on brain tumors, but it's not only true, like you can transfer those um, tools to other areas uh, like breast cancer or prostate where we have already some of those tools available and are using them uh, on a daily clinical practice. So coming back to stroke, uh, time is brain. Uh, that's what we learned over the last couple of years. But brain is also imaging because time or the time aspect has become a little bit less important because the new trials have shown that we now can treat the well-identified patient up to 24 hours after the onset of symptoms. Um, and therefore, we need precise imaging and imaging tools that enable us to detect 
and to categorize patients so that we select the right patient uh, to have a treatment even over a longer period of time. Um, and uh, so that window uh, gives us an opportunity, but it's also a challenge for us to really better identify or ideally identify those patients. So in stroke imaging, time is brain, um, as I said. So the ultimate goal of neuroimaging is to help the triage of the patients um, for a revascularization therapy. Um, and uh, we have to, on the other side, really use our imaging tools because uh, not only time matters, but also the imaging results matter um, to really identify um, and to visualize the physiologic information um, because we don't have that very rigid time frame anymore. So it's very important, and that has been a major change in the management of our stroke patients, specifically in the last two years. <coughs> So we have to exclude hemorrhage in nearly all of those stages, uh, whether we treat with uh, IV uh, lysis or whether we have a mechanical thrombectomy. The first step, very important, is a quick exclusion of hemorrhage. Uh, then we have to identify the acute lesion. <clears throat> uh, we can use MR or we can use CT. Uh, we have to look at the infarct um, extension uh, using the aspect score. Um, and then uh, we um, can decide whether this patient is a candidate for uh, IV treatment or start with IV treatment right away and then go on uh, within the 24 hours time frame to really do a thrombectomy. Um, and for the thrombectomy, we not only need the information from the brain, we need the vascular information. We need the information whether there's a, a stenosis or an occlusion or what is the status of the vessels of the, uh, of the patient. So this is also a, a very important information because the, tar the vessel is the target for the thrombectomy. <clears throat> and then if we treat uh, in a larger time frame, uh, especially in the window between 6 and 24 hours, which is the kind of expanded window that we have now available, again, we have to exclude hemorrhage. We have to measure the infarct extension. We have to look for proximal occlusions. Infarct core, penumbra, like we can do a mismatch either with CT, CT angio, CT perfusion, or with MR, the classical perfusion uh, diffusion mismatch. And then also important to look for collaterals. Like the collaterals is not, like, not sure yet where, what kind of a role they play, but it's important to have that information as well <laughs> to better triage those patients and then to open that window from zero to six up to 24 hours, which gives us a lot of opportunities because especially in my area, the province of Manitoba, it's larger than um, Germany, but it has only 1.5 million people. So and if there's a stroke a thousand kilometers away, uh, in the past, like you said, okay, if you're on, at your cottage and you have a stroke, that's it. Sorry, but now we have that larger window and we can actually bring in patients uh, for treatment, but we need that imaging information. But now in a center that is a thousand kilometers away, uh, which is a very small because the population is very small there, um, there's no radiologist, no subspecialty uh, stroke neurologist or uh, uh, radiologist out there. So we need to automatically process that uh, information and to provide to the experts at the main center so that they can treat the patient. So AI, automation is one tool that we really need and that we started to implement uh, over the last couple of years, and it's very helpful uh, in the day-to-day -day practice in, on a 24-hour basis that we get that information automatically processed, uh, looking at the stroke, stroke identification, uh, identification of a larger vessel occlusion, identification of the collaterals, and this information flows to the stroke neurologist, to the interventional radiologist, and they make that decision. And they don't even have to come to the hospital to make that decision. They can make it actually on their smartphone. So that's how it looks like. We have the non-contrast CT at, uh, admission. Then we have CT perfusion now available almost 24-7 at most of our centers. There doesn't need to be a radiologist there. That really goes automatically by the technologist. The uh, information is sent to the central server. It's processed and it's displayed on the smartphone of the stroke neurologist or the interventional radiologist. And um, uh, that's here the confirmation of uh, after 24 hours. Um, if you add that vascular information, the same thing. Uh, there's a non-contrast enhanced CT, there's a contrast enhanced CT, CT uh, uh, A, and also now CT perfusion. Um, and we correlate, of course, those findings also with follow-up um, MR imaging, like the DWI after 24 hours. But this information is now available on a 24-7 basis uh, throughout the entire province, uh, and it's centralized, processed, 
like in the cloud, the server does it, uh, and it's displayed, and then we can make that decision whether the patient is uh, still treatable in that window, um, and whether we have to fly them down or uh, to treat them locally with just IV treatment. Now we are getting a step further, and uh, Olea just uh, is in the development, and uh, uh, we are hopefully getting that uh, automation platform soon, where we look not only at perfusion, uh, and Anjo, but we, we look at um, many other areas, um, like uh, we look at the large vessel occlusion. Uh, so we get the large vessel occlusion detection, what has been presented in the previous presentation already. Uh, that's an established tool. It's integrated there, and it's an automated workflow. Uh, then we look at intracranial hemorrhage detection. That's very important to rule out hemorrhage um, uh, in a clinical environment. And then we get the aspect score automatically, which is important to really assess the size of the stroke and what kind of treatment options you have, and then the automated perfusion assessment. And so that's an optimal scenario to get a triage solution. We have the right data at the right time for the right uh, patient, um, and then we can refer the patient to the right person to treat. Uh, that's how it's looked like. Uh, it's a patient list, like you have the patients listed there. They come automatically in the workflow, and then you can identify uh, already patients that have a suspected hemorrhage. Uh, they will get a tool here, and you see, okay, there's hemorrhage. Uh, so this is definitely not a candidate for uh, uh, IV uh, treatment or for uh, thrombectomy in some of the cases uh, because there's a hemorrhage. It uh, also uh, makes a volumetric assessment of the hemorrhage. Um, then we get the information about the CT, CTA. It's all automatically processed and displayed. Um, and then we get an overall assessment, like we have the suspected hemorrhage. You see here the aspect score. You see the vascular information. You see the mismatch. Um, and again, you see here that small area of hemorrhage that is also present uh, in the patient. And um, this is information that is available now um, on a 24-7 basis uh, for the treating uh, uh, physicians, the stroke neurologists, uh, together with the interventional uh, neuroradiologists. So in oncologic imaging, we have a little bit more time, but it's as challenging, because uh, oncologic imaging has changed a lot over the last couple of years. The imaging requirements are getting more and more complex. Uh, we have high precision and individual therapies available, like radiosurgery up to multiple brain metastasis lesions, for example. Um, and for the ideal detection and delineation and visualization of these uh, oncologic lesions, uh, we need advanced imaging techniques that we have um, adapted, implemented, and adapted over the last couple of years. And I'm talking about perfusion imaging, talking about MR spectroscopy, dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging, diffusion tensor imaging, fMRI tools that are all used in the diagnostic workup of the patient, uh, in the treatment planning, as well as in the follow-up uh, of patients. And we have uh, way more precise and complex therapies uh, which need quantitative and multidimensional imaging for planning. So 3D visualization that uh, what, you said, uh, what you showed in your first presentation, uh, that 3D visualization of the object, it's very important for the oncologist to see in either the surgical planning, how do I approach, uh, what are the options from a surgical point of view, and that information, uh, the function information can flow into that data set uh, to get a perfect assessment of a a patient, whether it's treatable or not, how can we treat, what kind of tools do we need to treat, or do we need a combined uh, therapeutic approach. Um, and imaging is a key tool to differentiate tumor-related changes from treatment-related changes, and I will show you a couple of those examples. So we have integrated a so-called force dimension into our uh, oncologic assessment of patients. So we have the 3D volumetric assessment, but then we get additional information from those tools, spectroscopy, perfusion, diffusion, uh, tensor imaging, uh, functional MRI, and others. And we use it to get a better differential diagnosis, a better tumor grading, a treatment decision. Here its timing is not as important as for stroke, but still, like there's uh, patients that have acute symptoms in an oncologic environment, and then we need to have a fast decision as well. Uh, biopsy planning, treatment planning, and then treatment follow-up. And all has to be, of course, integrated into the clinical workflow. So it is, we are now beyond the steps of uh, research. Those tools are really available on a routine uh, 
uh, basis. And in our institution, we get those uh, data processed automatically with automatization processes, and they are available for reporting. They are part of our PAC system. So a few examples here. I hope I have a few more minutes. Uh, otherwise, I need an AI tool to <laughs> get faster through my presentation. So this is a patient who came with complex partial seizures. It's a 20-year-old um, female. <laughs> And you see there's a lesion. Of course, you can identify that lesion, but we don't know. There's a multiple differential diagnosis. It uh, can be mesial temporal sclerosis, could be an oncology case, um, and so on. So we did MR perfusion here. We did perfusion measurement. It's an OLEA tool that we use on a routine basis. It automatically processes our perfusion information, and then we can quantify. We can make regions of interest. We can calculate ratios. And you see that this area here at the medial temporal lobe is higher perfused than the contralateral side. So a mesial temporal sclerosis is not higher perfused. So the, uh, like we are now away from a more benign finding, we are uh, on the way to a malignant finding. And then we added um, um, MR spectroscopy and other tools, and it's a glial tumor, and based on the high perfusion value, we even suspect that it's an anaplastic transformation present, even the, the, the tumor is not enhancing. Um, here, another tool here, that's a 45-year-old female. She had a previous resection of an oligoastrocytoma, uh, uh, grade 2, so a benign tumor um, or not malignant tumor, like a grade 2. Um, and you see there's a regrowth of the tumor. You see the T2 changes. And in one stop shop, we kind of get all the information. We get perfusion. Here's the quality measurement of the bolus that we injected. And then you get the uh, uh, blood volume, blood flow, and all the other maps that we need from the perfusion imaging uh, over multiple slices. That's an automated process. So it's sent to the workstation, and then um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, it's available for reporting uh, for the radiologists. And here it was a recurrent glial tumor with suspected anaplastic transformation. So another scenario here, my last case, uh, it's a patient with a previous resection of an oligodendroglioma. Uh, developed again some clinical symptoms and that large area of T2 hyperintensity. We don't know whether this is tumor-related or treatment-related. She had radiation chemotherapy. Um, and, of course, a, a partial uh, resection here. You see the resection cavity. But if we add that perfusion information that we get now in an automated fashion, uh, we see that this area is not perfused at all. It's actually a pretty uh, low perfused, and uh, so we can say that this is likely not a tumor. It's likely treatment-related changes, cladic changes after uh, combined radiation and chemotherapy. Again, here we can do these uh, quantitative measurements. We can uh, look at ratios, and we know already that there are ratios that are trending towards a higher-grade tumor uh, compared to a low-grade tumor. So here it was radiation-induced tissue changes. So to conclude, um, I think our area in radiology and the future of radiology will change pretty uh, rapidly. Uh, it's volume-driven. It's driven by the more and more complexity that we have uh, in our clinical environment. And therefore, we need uh, to implement and integrate AI tools and automation tools and even visualization tools into our clinical workflow uh, to manage uh, the complex clinical environment of our patients. And um, I'm pretty sure AI will not replace the radiologist. It will be an important tool that helps us to survive um, uh, this uh, uh, like um, current environment with increasing workflow and a lot of complexity and a lack of radiologists worldwide. Um, the advanced information, the combination of multiple findings, the integration of functional and uh, quantitative imaging data uh, it's not only true for radiology. I think in the future, radiology might even use additional data like lab data that we have available, uh, laboratory findings, uh, histologic findings, pathophysiologic findings that are all integrated in the electronic medical record. They, I think, will be further integrated into our radiology diagnostic process in the future. So we will probably become uh, a data manager or a so-called diagnostic consultant in the future. Um, I think you don't need necessarily uh, a PhD degree in uh, computer science or rocket science for that. Um, probably people that are developing those tools, they need it, but we need to be open and to really adopt those techniques and uh, see that we need them to really manage our future. 
Uh, so radiology was and is today even a more data-driven specialty. We have been data-driven, but the data is getting more and more, and it's getting more and more complex. Therefore, we need those, um, this AI evolution or revolution uh, that has a huge impact on healthcare these days. Uh, it will also provide us new opportunities to improve patient care, that's for sure. We have shown it here in uh, stroke and uh, brain tumors already. Um, and uh, these informations need to be available. They need to be available in time, quantitative, three-dimensional, um, and need to be integrated into a clinical workflow. And uh, we have, at the end, uh, like really that's my last sentence, a very unique opportunity to become a data expert or a data manager, not only of radiological data, but also other patient data like lab or uh, pathology data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. As, uh, I think we're right. I think we're out of time. Uh, that concludes the symposium. Thank you, uh, Dr. Essig, Dr. Chang, for those excellent lectures. If there are any questions, please feel free. Uh, step up, speak with us. We'd be happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time, your attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.